It has been well established that companies with more ethnic, cultural, and gender diversity are more innovative and profitable than those without. Being intentional about diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy simply makes good business sense. But how do you do that? What strategies actually work? Our Diverse by Design podcast tells the stories of visionaries who are actually changing the diversity landscape of tech and explores the strategies they're using to become more diverse by design. Omanase Obugwe, Prescola's Senior Director of Diverse by Design, is a diversity champion focused on creating a workforce centered around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Omanase has always considered herself an advocate for others throughout her career in the nursing field and broadened her scope by working as an inclusion consultant within the nonprofit industry. Over the years, she has personally developed herself to be knowledgeable about diversity, becoming certified in DEI, leadership, and removing barriers to change. Omnase is thrilled about her role with Diverse by Design to continue her lifelong commitment to bringing DEIB to life within organizations. Hello, hello, my name is Ken Walker. I am Executive Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Belonging, and Culture at Perscolis. And we have a new member of the team, Omanase, recently started as a Senior Director of Diverse by Design. Welcome, Omanase. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Great, great, great. So first question, tell us a little bit about your name. It's a, it's an unusual one. So share. Yes, my name is Omanase Obogwe. Um, it's a Nigerian name. I was born in Kaduna, Nigeria. I'm Edo. And my name actually means no matter all the riches or the glory or fame, there's nothing like the love of your children. So I'm the firstborn to my, my parents. Ah, I love that. And I love stories behind um, names. Um, So thank you for sharing. How did you go from a career in nursing to becoming a DEI practitioner? Because that's that's not a typical um, roadmap. I agree. Um, It's very difficult to see the correlation between the two and, and between nursing and DEI. But then I realized um, as a nurse for a very long time, I was always an advocate. I was always a nurse um, advocating for my patients or for even other nurses, new nurses, older nurses um, in a variety of settings for a variety of different types of people from all types of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, just working to help let the public and the community know what's available to them because it's kind of not something that's advertised. So uh, I help my grandmother's friends understand insurance paperwork and um, sometimes helping them ask people questions at the doctor's office. So I did motivational speaking, I did public speaking, and I was approached by a gentleman who needed some help with his organization. And that was my first step into DEI. He felt like, wow, you're a great advocate and my organization could really use your help for some people that work there. So that was my first pivot into it. And I just been nonstop with it. So the last mm-hmm. past almost eight years, that's what I've been doing. I've been advocating continuously um, for people from historically uh, denied or underrepresented populations. And I feel like I'm good at it. And I, it's something that I really enjoy. And it's something that's very personal to me as well. Ah, so talk to me a little bit about the personal um, piece. Um, you know, what, what drives you? What motivates you to continue in the field? Uh, I, to be fully transparent, uh, some days are easy, right? And then some days are a little bit hard because just the society that we live in, there's always something to advocate for. Mm-hmm. So personally, for me, uh, a mother, I have two children. Uh, my youngest son is autistic with several other diagnoses. And although I've taken care of children, um, as a pediatric nurse for some time too, I wasn't as close to it as having somebody in your home with you day in and day out that you're responsible for. Um, so my son taught me a lot and he keeps me motivated and I am just bent on creating a world that he will be his full self 
in and be valued as his full self. Um, and then also my oldest keeps me motivated, keeps me on my toes because he's always thought outside of the box. He was the child mm -hmm. I could never out talk or out idea or out create. He always found another way. And um, that continuously pushes me in this work as well. Oh, and I say, I so appreciate you sharing um, the personal story of your of your children, um, because I think, you know, that allows you to to bring your full self um, yeah. into the conversation, into the environments that you're in. And so um, thank you for that. Yes. Yeah. Omanase, what's the biggest impact you want to see in the technology industry? How much time do we have? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's it's um it's a it's a onion question. And by that, what I mean, it has a couple of different layers. Uh, I would love to see more women. I would love to see more equitable pay. I would love to see more neurodiverse people within technology. I would like to see retention rates go up for um, black and brown people within tech and for women as well. Uh, I would like to see more tech organizations create work cultures that are appreciative and embracing like they say they are, but they're actually doing that work. So my impact would be multiple things that I would like to say or see rather that would make a really big difference in my opinion. Okay, and and you brought up a very interesting point because you and I have experienced over the years a number of different organizations who have made pledges to DEI yes. and, and here we are yes. um, post George Floyd and not a lot has happened. Um, so as you as you think about forward movement and, and to encourage these organizations to do more, um, what are some of the things that you you would like to see them um, prioritize? Give me your top three. The things I would like to see them prioritize is, and I don't know if this is a term everyone uses, but the one of the bigger ones for me is gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see them reevaluate who's keeping the gate. You know, I want recruiters to go through specialized training um, so they can understand what inclusive rec recruiting even looks like, diversified recruiting, what different candidate pools can look like, where they can come from. Um, trying to break down the quote unquote traditional way that they do things would be one top priority for me. The second top priority would be re around retention by creating those psychologically <laughs> safe work culture spaces, both mm -hmm. whether you work remotely or in the office, um, that heavily target training around implicit bias and microaggressions. And that's something we've been saying for years, mm -hmm. but I would love to see more action happening around it. And third, I would just like to see more people that look like me <laughs> um, coming into the doors and staying in because they're happy and feel like they're actually a part of things and not, you know, the afterthought of an idea or even not even being asked what their ideas are. So not just having the whole seat at the table, but actually having a, a chance to talk at the table too. So those would be my top three things. That's great. In the, in the in inclusive belonging piece of, of what we do in our work, um, you are elevating um, with, your, with your third priority. And I love that because when you don't feel connected um, or you don't feel included, um, it just takes away from your experience at your new organization. Oh, so. wholeheartedly. Yeah. Um, and I know you mentioned, especially like the whole post George Floyd. And I think for me, someone who's been so passionate about DEI, yes, there were a lot of organizations that all of a sudden you've seen like a mad, almost seemed like a mad rush. Every other day, somebody was making a pledge or saying we stand with this or we're doing that, we're doing that. And unfortunately, a lot of that was performative. Um, I'm definitely about transformative. Like I would like to see more of the action. Um, and in the words of my mom, yes, 
George Floyd happened and it was sad and it was sad the way it happened. And unfortunately, it's not the first time something like this in this country has happened. Um, these things like this have always happened. I think social media has given us a very big window around the world about a lot of the injustices that are occurring. Um, so I almost say we're we're still in post Emmett Till era. We're still, you know, there's still a lot of things that have happening that are clearly affecting how our organizations work. And every day when you think about, when you look at your own organizations too, I tell people, do you really feel like you can be yourself at work? Are you bringing your whole self to work? And if you are not, ask yourself why first and then start to ask your organization. Love that, love that. So I'm gonna pivot, um, I'm gonna say, um, and go in another direction. Okay. As you know, um, we have um, held a number of diverse by design conversations across the nation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one day events, you know, a um, couple of hours um, across the various regions. We've been in Pittsburgh, we've been in Mountain View, California. Um, Tell me, as we continue these conversations around diversity, what would your ideal event look like? Oh, it would be immersive. And by immersive, I don't, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Vincent Van Gogh immersive experience, um, mm -hmm. but I had the opportunity to go see that in New York uh, one day, and as well as the MoMA, two of my favorite places. Um, but they're so engaging. So an ideal experience for me would go beyond sitting and listening to people talk about things. I would love to show people how a neurodiverse interview would look like, you know, um, what that process would look like. I would love to show people with a hypersensitive or hyposensitive work environment includes or excludes for that matter. Um, I would like for people to be able to see it more in action so that they can make it more applicable to their own work environments. So they can take that information back and say, okay, no, I've seen how it's done. Some people learn that way. You know, a lot of people do by seeing it in action. So that way they can leave our space, go back to their organizations and have some good conversations with great context, as opposed to saying what I heard when I was there was, or what was said was, but they can go back and actually start saying what I saw while I was there or what I have seen different from what we are doing, you know, I think being able to put people in an environment that engages them more beyond mm -hmm. seeing and listening, but they're up, they're walking around, going to different stations. So to me, it almost looks like a science fair. You know, back in the day for school, people did science fair and all the projects were lined up and you could go around and look at each station. So for me, it would look something like that eventually one day. I love that. And I too, um... Went to the Van Gogh <laughs> exhibit. I went okay. in Miami. Um, I'm in New York, but I went in Miami and I've been um, becoming more of a fan of these immersive um, experiences because I do agree with you. Um, you really need to be able to, to dig into some of these, um, these subjects um, and really sort of uh, spend time um, going deep, leaning in, um, and immersive um, experiences definitely lends itself to that. Yes, uh, remember it. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Um, I'm going to say, what's your superpower? What makes you unique as a DEI practitioner? Um, I believe my superpower... <laughs> As I say, the old term, it's a gift and a curse, but my superpower is my ability to just create. Um, my thoughts of being creative are the things that keep me up at night. They're the things I will always have more ideas than time, money, and probably lifespan <laughs> at the rate that I go, but I tend to write them all down as much as I can. But my superpower is just coming up with something else. So I'm always outside of the box. Yeah, and you know, I'm gonna say I've experienced that in the the three months that we've worked. <laughs> what you bring, <laughs> to the table. 
<laughs> what you bring to the table from a creative um, standpoint, I find has been additive to our collective work together. Um, and I appreciate it. Um, I don't always bring that level of creativity. Um, well, from an execution standpoint, now I can, I can, I, I, I have a lot of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you'll put it together in, in a presentation or a deck that um, I found to be of great value. So um, Thank you. I, I agree that is, that is your superpower. When did you realize, all right, so you have this superpower, um, but when did you realize, when was the moment that you said, ah, this is the line of work for me? Oh, um, I have a couple of moments like that. Um, and the more, the older I get and the more I look back over life, I realize I had those moments and I ignored them. Mm. And I'm not happy about that. But sitting here today, and, and it's funny because I had this, this conversation with a good friend of mine last week. And she was asking me, like, when did you realize this is what you like to do? You know, just bouncing ideas off of her. And I said, you know, I don't know. Um, and then she said, no, I remember. Mm. And I said, really? She said, yeah. Do you remember Mr. Johnson's seventh grade English class? And I was like, what? <laughs> Uh, I did like that class because I just liked writing, but she said she still remembers me getting up and reading something to the class um, that was talking about children, young Black children that were going missing. Mm. No one was paying attention to it and how impacted our teacher was that he shared it with the other teachers and they started to realize that they didn't talk about it, you know? Um, and, and I think sixth grade was the OJ Simpson trial. And there was more conversation around that as opposed to the children who were going missing that looked like us, you know, at the time. And she said, I think that's when it started for you. She said, honestly, I don't think you've ever stopped. You've always been wanting to protest of something. You always want to get in the fight as opposed to avoid it, so to speak. So I guess via her, that was the earliest moment. Um, but professionally, I, I have to say it's in nursing. It started in with me there as well. I've seen mm -hmm. it like book go off again. You know, it goes off and you kind of ignore it, but you don't realize that's still what you're doing every single day. Mm -hmm. So I can't say anymore that it was just one moment. There's been several throughout my life. And and that's so true, right? Our, our lives um, evolve, you know, how we, how we see ourselves, um, how we we pivot on our worldview um, from our 20s, 30s, 40s, um, um, yeah. changes us, right? And so um, being cognizant of that, I, I always I always say to folks, you know, the 50-year-old the, the Ken is very different than um, the 20-year-old Ken, um, and I love them both. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So so last question, um, Omanase. So Diverse by Design is, is your baby. Um, and, you know, we get to create and, and we've already identified that you are a creative. Mm -hmm. um, so what's, 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 the, what's the big, big, I mean, big, hairy, audacious, fantastic, wonderful goal that we we should expect um, with Omanase leading the charge. Uh, and I, I think I spoke to you about this before, but one of the biggest things I want to do is, or be a part of building or helping someone build, or we just build it ourselves, is creating um a software application where employees that work in various organizations feel comfortable enough to express the things that they're going through um, and based on their feedback, be able to provide their organization with the necessary training to help retain not only just that one employee, but others who may be feeling the same way. 
I do recall you saying that. Yeah. Well, I love the fact that you're consistent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I know I, I talked with people about this um, maybe a couple of years ago, um, a young lady I met, my, I think it was out of D.C., um, and she had a very similar um, idea, too. Like, is this something that we felt that was needed? I don't know if it's because we were two, um, me, Nigerian-American, like two Black women that were professionals and have experienced situations where you felt like you couldn't be honest in your feedback. And mm. because of that, I don't think people realize when you're not honest in your feedback, it sometimes affects the type of professional development you get. It affects the the um, the the concept that people don't feel like need anything needs to change or get better. You know, that, oh everything's fine because nobody's saying anything. You know, nobody's complaining <laughs> or saying that something is wrong. So when that happens, we actually kind of shoot ourselves in the foot. So we wanted to like see like how could that be different. And for me, it was like you know what we need a window for people to be able to yell out of and say, hey, this is happening to me. And I, I would like to know how it can be fixed or what can be done, or if somebody can come and help, you know, um, based on feedback. And then organizations, of course, would get like some type of a score and based on that score in a certain category, you know, come in and provide them with that training. Okay, well, Umanase, you know, I am, I'm a big fan of a big idea and, if I can be a colleague that can help you make that happen and and maybe, you know, monetize this idea, how awesome that would be. I agree. Um, I, agree. So, I think it's so. the right place, you know. Um, at Perscolas, we have some great minds, you know, um, from our current learners to our graduates that probably have... Um, the brain power to build such a thing, you know? So it, it'll be interesting. I'm looking forward to my time here yeah. at Solis, here with Deepak. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, as we conclude this conversation, yeah, let's, let's tee that up for one of our awesome, wonderful learners um, because that would be a great story, right? That, yeah. that we were able to create this wonderful application um, with the learners that that we bring through our training program. So so yeah. I'm going to keep that in mind, um, Omanase. Thank you so much um, for sharing who you are um, and what you bring to the table, some of your your goals and desires. And I'm I'm looking forward to our continued work together. Same. I'm excited. All right. Take care. You too. Diverse by Design is powered by Perscolis and the IT Senior Management Forum. To learn more about how we can help your organization become more diverse by design, visit our website at diversebydesign.org. Before we let you go, we want to thank our sponsors, Tech Systems, JP Morgan Chase, Google, Chubb, and Comcast NBC Universal for their support. If you like what you heard, make sure you subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss any insights about how you can make your organization diverse by design. Until next time.